I want to welcome everyone uh, today for, for coming out uh, to this Defending Defense event. Uh, it's a coalition effort of American Enterprise Institute, the Foreign Policy Initiative, and the Heritage Foundation. I'm Jamie Fly. I'm the Executive Director of the Foreign Policy Initiative. Uh, we've titled today's event, Choosing to Decline the Meaning of Obama's Defense Guidance and Budget. And uh, I know it's a somewhat provocative title, but I think uh, the Defending Defense Coalition strongly believes uh, that we face uh, a, a key moment in uh, our country's national security debate right now. And uh, the budget that we saw presented earlier this week included uh, uh, already uh, around $500 billion worth of cuts over the next 10 years. We have the looming sequestration potential of uh, an additional $500 billion over the next 10 years. And I think uh, those just staggering statistics uh, necessitate the sort of discussion we're going to have today. One of the frustrations that I know we've had is that uh, this administration has not shown a lot of leadership in confronting these challenges, um, has uh, insisted on going after defense rather than protecting it. And I think what we wanted to do is highlight some of the people who are leading in Washington, uh, particularly members of Congress, and we've got a great lineup today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to former Senator Jim Talent, who's going to be our moderator. Uh, he's in part wearing his Heritage Foundation hat today. Uh, but he's also a co-chairman of uh, Mercury, uh, a public strategy firm. So, Senator Talent, why don't you take it away? Uh, thank you, Jamie. I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, before I do that, this little housekeeping detail, there is coffee and uh, orange juice and rolls in the back. And if you haven't got one, go get it and feel free to eat it while these people are speaking. They're all members of Congress or the Senate, and they're used to people not paying attention when they're speaking, so that won't bother them. There's a lot to pay attention to today. We do have a very good lineup, and we're hopeful of being able to have questions and answers with some or all of the speakers. Uh, our first speaker today is Senator John Kyle. Uh, he really needs no introduction, but I'm, that's what I'm doing here today, so I'm going to do that. Um, Senator Kyle is uh, currently serving his third term in the United States Senate after having completed four terms representing Arizona's 4th District in the United States House of Representatives. I should say that's where I first met Senator Kyle. He and I served on the House Armed Services Committee together, and um, he is one of the people that I recognized right away uh, would be a model worth uh, following in my own service in the Congress. Uh, John was elected unanimously by his colleagues in 2008 to serve as Republican whip. Uh, he, uh, he serves on the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Senate Finance Committee, before his public service, Senator Kyle practiced law at Jennings, Strauss, and Salmon in, um, in Phoenix. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Senator John Kyle. Thank you, Jim. Thanks very much. Uh, I want to compliment Jim, one of the people who not only carried out a strong commitment to national security in the Congress, but also in the real world, has been my colleague Jim Talent. And I thank you for carrying that on. And, and when I'm done serving in public uh, service at the end of this year, I hope to be able to do something that will enable me to continue fighting some of these battles, Jim, that I know you and, and so many of you here in this room have, have uh, fought. Um, today, I mean, today is a rather propitious uh, time at the end of a week where two major things occurred, uh, which will be the focus of my uh, remarks here. One, the President's budget, and I'm going to speak on how that specifically impacts our nuclear modernization program. And secondly, the announcement a couple of days ago that the effort was on way, uh, underway to evaluate potential reduction of our nuclear weaponry down to levels uh, that uh, were unheard of or, or seemed to me to be um, uh, unthinkable, and that's uh, getting the number of warheads down to a level like 300. We'll talk some more about that. But I wanted to begin by addressing a subject that I know that Senator Ayotte and uh, Representative McKeon will talk about, so I'm just going to introduce the subject, and then uh, I'm sure they'll do it in a lot more detail. As uh, Senator Talent said, we've got, or Jamie, I guess, said, we've got a real problem facing us at the very beginning of next year because of the Defense Policy Act, which, excuse me, the, the, the Budget uh, Policy Act, which sets the levels of funding for the next 10 years and provided an automatic sequestration of $1.2 trillion if we weren't able to reach a um, reduction of that amount in the Joint Select Committee that failed to do so. As a result, each year, about one-tenth of that amount, or about $109 billion, will automatically be cut 50-50 across defense discretionary and non-defense discretionary part of the budget. 
and everyone agrees that the meat axe approach is not the right way to do it, as a result of which Senator McCain, Senator Ayotte, uh, and a group of other senators have introduced legislation that is quite similar to that introduced by Representative McKeon that would, for the first year of the 10 years, avoid the sequester by reducing by one-tenth the sequester amount, or $109 billion. Uh, we do that for both defense and non-defense because it's obvious that the people who uh, have primarily a mission to save education funding or transportation funding or whatever it might be are going to be uh, as uh, interested in avoiding the sequester as those of us who are more interested in defense spending. And most members of Congress care about national defense as well. So uh, the $109 billion would cover the entire uh, amount that would be sequestered in the first year. And essentially, the work will have to continue every year thereafter to find about $109 billion either in revenue or in savings. So that by the end of the 10 years, we still get the $1.2 trillion in, uh, in budget savings, but we haven't done it in a, in a meat ax approach. Uh, our approach uh, to fund it uh, simply continues the pay freeze that the President put into effect through uh, June of 2014, and it has a much more, um, uh, well, it, it, it has an attrition rate of federal employees that is only half as much as the Simpson Bowles called for, so that for every three employees that voluntarily leave government, uh, service, you would replace two of them, but not three. Simpson Bowles recommended replacing only one. So we would eventually reduce the workforce by about 5%, and I don't know of anybody that doesn't think that can be done. So this is a relatively painless way to achieve the 100 plus billion dollars for the first year to avoid sequestration. Well, again, that's all I'm going to say on that. I think you all recognize um, the reason for it. Uh, Secretary Panetta said that the sequester would do catastrophic damage to our military and its ability to protect the country. And what's amazing to me is the President said he would veto any effort to do this. Now, he's the Commander-in-Chief, and when his own Defense Secretary says it would be catastrophic, it seems to me the President needs to readjust his thinking on that. Incidentally, when Lindsey Graham asked Secretary Panetta, wouldn't this be kind of like shooting ourselves in the foot, he said, no, Senator, it would be more like shooting ourselves in the head. So bottom line is we've got to find an alternative to the automatic sequester. Now, let me turn to the other two subjects. First of all, the budget was announced this week, and I'm going to focus just on that part of the budget that relates to our nuclear weapon program, specifically the modernization program. Recall what the big fight was before the New START Treaty was voted on in the Senate. I know because I led the fight. We had done enough of an analysis of the necessary modernization program for our nuclear weapons that uh, we knew that it was underfunded in the President's budget. And we argued that over a 10-year period, it was underfunded by about $10 billion, or about a uh, billion dollars a year. And we argued and argued, and the administration finally conceded that we were right. Uh, during the Veterans Day recess, uh, just before the START Treaty uh, was taken up on the Senate floor, uh, General Chilton, uh, uh, head of STRATCOM, uh, a representative of NNSA and uh, Secretary Jim Miller, Dr. Miller, on behalf of the Defense Department, flew out to Phoenix to brief me in a secure facility. And we talked about the size that we would need in terms of the number of warheads. We talked about the triad. And we talked about the facilities that needed to be rebuilt, the life extension programs that were needed to refurbish our nuclear weapons, and so on. And in effect, what they said was, you were right, Senator Kyle. Our analysis was underfunding this, and we agree that we need to add something around $4.5 billion to the five-year uh, program for modernization. And I believe that if we, if we had carried this out over 10 years, it would have reflected another five. But uh, to be fair to them, they only focused on the fit up, and, uh, and therefore uh, just a little under $5 billion for uh, the five years. As a result, a revised 1251, Section 1251 of, of the law that requires this modernization program to be outlined and costed, a revised version of uh, the 1251 study was presented. And uh, to their credit, the administration reflected the new thinking that added the four plus, four and a half billion dollars roughly to the program to ensure that the facilities could be built, the life extension programs could be completed, the surveillance that was necessary, the other work at the labs, and we also focused on the necessary um, 
uh, changes in the triad, given the fact that uh, our, our triad is in need of uh, um, modernization as well. What the budget does is to throw away all of that work and go back on the commitment that was made. It goes right back to where it was before the 1251 report revisions. The cuts for next year called for in the budget are $372 million, and over the five-year period, that's $4.3 billion, exactly the amount that we knew was going to be needed to upgrade the modernization program to really meet the needs. Now, the administration might say, well, Congress actually reduced the money in the budget by $400 million last year, and therefore we're just uh, following along with what Congress did. Well, neither the SASC nor the HASC agreed. They authorized the full funding that, to their credit, the administration had asked for in last year's budget. And it just seems to me that this is more of an excuse than um, a real uh, reason to reduce the funding in the budget this year. Because the administration had committed to me and committed to all the members of the Senate that they would request full funding this year, next year, and in the out years. And in fact, that they would try to advance the construction of the CMRR, the one of the two main facilities that have to be reconstructed, uh, as quickly as they could. And of course, this puts the brakes to that. So I, I think uh, the commitment that was made to us has been broken. And it's been broken on a false premise, namely that Congress just would never support it. The Budget Act of last year didn't leave enough money for Congress to distribute, but they did all they could. The appropriators did, I think, the best they could to fill that hole. And we even were able to get, at the very end of the session, a transfer of funding from the Defense Department to the Department of Energy um, of uh, roughly a, a $150 million or a little less to fill the gap for certain key programs that the Department of Defense identified as critical as the customer of the Department of Energy uh, that has the custody of the nuclear weapons and would be responsible for their use. So I think they did everything that they could. The administration, on the other hand, and I'm not talking about the Defense Department, I'm talking about the administration, uh, decided that they would use this as a reason to reduce the funding and as a result to go back on the commitment. Now, what will the practical effect of this be? Well, there's going to be a two-year extension in the life, ex two-year delay in the life extension for the B61. That's the one that has to be done like yesterday. Um, a two-year delay in the W76 deliveries. Uh, at least a five-year delay in the new uranium processing facility at. Um, uh, uh, Los Alamos, the, the CMRR, the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uranium facility is at uh, uh, Oak Ridge. This facility, by the way, is, uh, has increased in cost, not because of anything that's gone wrong with the calculations, but because of the potential for earthquake damage in the region, which has required them to just pour a lot more concrete and steel in it. So it's, it's not the fault of Los Alamos lab that the cost of the plutonium facility is, has gone up some. Now, it also will impact the triad. The follow-on nuclear ballistic missile submarine has now been delayed by two years. That will not only affect our program, but also the British program. Uh, there is funding for a new strategic bomber, but it's basically just on the drawing boards, and there's no commitment that it will be nuclear certified. And uh, there's no clear plan for a new ICBM or an air-launched cruise missile. I spoke about the fact that the President had made the commitment to us. Um, Secretary Gates reflected the fact that these commitments were one of the reasons the START Treaty was adopted. He told Congress, this modernization program was very carefully worked out between ourselves and the Department of Energy, and frankly, where we came out on that played a fairly significant role in the willingness of the Senate to ratify the new START Agreement. So those senators who voted for the new START Agreement, I think, are going to want to carefully reflect on the promises that were made to them much of which was the basis for their agreement to vote for START. In his message to us, here's what the President said he would do. He promised, and th these are his words, to accelerate to the extent possible the design and engineering phase of the CMRR that I spoke of. Instead, now we're going to have a five-year delay. And quote, to request full funding, including on a multi-year basis. And of course, that wasn't done. Instead, it's cut back. Um, so, 
the impact of the budget on the nuclear modernization program is going to take us right back to where we were before all of the work that was done pre-start. And Congress is going to have to address that. Uh, there are a couple of ways we can do it. One way is to build on some legislation that the House got passed, which was to connect up the funding for the reductions in nuclear warheads called for by New START to adequate funding for modernization. If you, if you can't modernize uh, what we've got, then uh, it's more difficult to get rid of some of the weapons we have and still have the same degree of deterrent. So if the administration wants to help out here in reducing the number of warheads, they can help us get the funding uh, across the board for modernization. Now let me turn to the other subject, the reports that the administration is evaluating a reduction in nuclear warheads uh, by up to 80%. Uh, well, what's the proper number? We talked to a lot of people before the START Treaty, and I mentioned General Chilton before. Here's, here's what he said with regard to the numbers that were identified in New START. And he said this, uh, I think the arsenal that we have is exactly what is needed today to provide the deterrent. It is sized to be able to allow us to hedge both against technical failures in the current deployed arsenal and any geopolitical concerns that might cause us to need more weapons. So what are some of the implications of going below those numbers that the former head of STATCOM said were, were necessary? Well, first, some people have said you might be able to reduce the number of warheads, but only if we have a robust missile defense system and we build up our conventional capabilities. And in the budget, both of those items are dramatically reduced. And this administration has no commitment, uh, serious commitment to either one. How would cheating affect strategic balance? If you've got uh, 1,000 or 1,500 warheads, you can do a whole lot better if the other side cheats than if you get down to what is deemed to be a bare minimum. How about the peer competitors? A 300 number would take us down. I mean, the Chinese would have more than we have. I mean, this is a number where anybody that wanted to could build up to that number and be a peer with the United States. The whole point of nuclear deterrent is to have so much and so great a capability that nobody ever messes with you. It's the Reagan doctrine of peace through strength. You're strong enough that nobody is tempted to try to get what you have and cause trouble. Um, what about the allies that depend on our nuclear umbrella. Are they going to be satisfied? What about the fact that if we get down to that level uh, and you start having more countries be beyond North Korea and Iran and countries like that develop the capability, you're just going to proliferate. And one can only look to the Middle East to see the countries that would be interested in acquiring their own capability. Um, finally, for my friends who agree with the President that we should significantly reduce the number of warheads, Think about one of the doctrinal changes that usually accompanies that determination. Instead of holding military assets at risk, which takes quite a few nuclear warheads, um, if you just have a few, uh, your deterrent is, is essentially to hold civilians at risk, innocent civilians in cities, because that's all the weapons you have uh, to put against targets. I don't think that's a doctrine the United States wants to engage in, and I don't think that's what proponents of lower numbers of weapons support either. So we would have to have significant changes in doctrine were we to get down to that low. In addition, you have to look at the threat. And I know some people believe that the administration has picked out a number first and then they want to get a study that uh, rationalizes that number by uh, determining that the threat wasn't nearly as great as we thought it was. Uh, you, ha you start with a proper analysis of the threat and then size your force to meet that threat. That's the case for military doctrine, whether it's nuclear or conventional. Uh, you don't start with how much money you think you want to spend or a level of the number of tanks that you're going to build or the number of nuclear weapons you're going to have and then develop a strategy based upon that. Um, that's a sure uh, path to uh, not being able to deter aggression. And what's going on around the world today? Well, actually, Russia is placing more emphasis on its nuclear forces, not less. And in fact, uh, uh, the Deputy Defense Minister uh, said recently, I do not rule out that under certain circumstances we will have to boost, not cut, our nuclear arsenal. So I wonder how the President thinks he's going to get the Russians to agree to lower even below where they are today. Remember, under the START Treaty, we had to lower the number of uh, weapons in our inventory. The Russians didn't have to take a single one out because they were already at that level. And now they're talking about boosting, not lowering. So how is the President going to negotiate a new treaty with the, with the Russians on this? They've even gotten to the point where their doctrine now includes the use of nuclear weapons in the event of an attack, in the event of a conventional attack. So 
China. China is modernizing its forces to a point that is pretty incredible. Um, just enough said about that. Pakistan. Pakistan is about to overtake Great Britain in the number of nuclear weapons it has. Not exactly the most stable place in the world. Iran, we all understand what's going on there. And then here's something interesting. At the very point in time that we should be emphasizing uh, non-proliferation and, and demanding conditions on a country that want to, quote, go nucle nuclear that prevent them from developing uh, weapons-grade material, the administration is weakening the requirements, the former gold standard that we had applied to countries um, in our nuclear cooperation agreements. In, in the agreements proposed with Jordan and Vietnam, uh, we would not require those countries to relinquish their right to enrichment, something that, of course, we're asking Iran to do, and we had asked other countries to do. So what's this about? I mean, if you're going to have a strategy against other countries proliferating nuclear weapons, you don't get your number down to the point where they feel they have to, and change our standards for nuclear cooperation agreements in ways that would permit them to develop the, the material. So just conclude on this point. Uh, if the president is suggesting we need to get down to 300 to save money, it doesn't save money. It's like BRAC. If he believes we need to do that to set a moral example in the world because then other countries will reduce their uh, their stockpiles or will agree not to go forward, I ask, okay, and we did that with START. How is that working out in terms of other countries reducing their arsenals or foregoing their weapons? Russia, the object of our relationship, our reset relationship, is now talking about raising, not lowering, their number of warheads. Our moral example certainly hasn't impressed countries like Iran, North Korea, uh, the bottom line is that these are not arguments for going to a lower number. I recognize this is the president's vision. He wants a world without nuclear weapons. But this is not the time and this is not the way to advance that idealistic goal. I'll just finish with, uh, again, the point I made earlier. The best way to deter aggression is to be strong enough that nobody wants to be tempted to cause trouble. It is the doctrine of peace through strength. And a key component of that doctrine is our nuclear deterrent. We must not let it deteriorate to the point that it doesn't achieve the reason why we have it. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. And if there's nobody else here to speak, I'd take a question or two or a uh, comment. Thank uh, you I, so I much. I noted um, your comment about the roles. And as long as they're not hard roles, it, it'll work out OK. So. Yeah. Um, uh, our arms control negotiating approach has always been essentially to uh, compare ourselves to the Soviet Union and then to the Russians, but as other nations build up their nuclear inventories and we reduce ours, it changes the equation. It's not just a, a two-sided game or a two-sided negotiation, but a multiplayer game. I'd be interested to know what you think the world would look like if the American nuclear arsenal is functionally no larger than the Chinese arsenal or the Indian arsenal or the Pakistani arsenal or what have you, what does a multipolar nuclear world look like to right. you? Tom, uh, we used to measure ourselves against the Soviet Union. Did we have enough to deter them? And then the Chinese came, came along. They weren't that capable, but we wanted to make sure we had enough of a hedge there in the event that we needed to cover two countries that we could. Well, then the Bush administration, after the Soviet Union's demise, voluntarily, unilaterally reduced our nuclear weapons and uh, essentially said, look, these are costly. We're going to get rid of a bunch of them. And to the Russians at that point, if you want to reduce yours, do so too. And they did out of their own self-interest, but not because we had a big treaty. So that's where it stood uh, until, I would say, a few, uh, few years ago when uh, Russia decided it had to get back in the nuclear game in a really big way, developing new nuclear weapons, new types of nuclear weapons, new delivery systems, and uh, a doctrine that actually called for the use of those weapons. At the same time that our intelligence demonstrates that we have new threats from the Chinese to potentially be worried about in the event of a conflict with them, and potentially the need to cover some additional targets as well. So with New START, we get down to a level that our experts said are just about right, certainly not too many, to deal with the threat from Russia. And you noticed in General Chilton's testimony, he also said, 
and potential technical problems with our own weapons. The bottom line is you can't necessarily count on 100% of your weapons working exactly as you intend them to work. So you've got to be careful that you've got enough of a hedge there. And we don't have a production uh, capacity like the Russians do, so what we have is what we got. We're not going to be able to build any more. If you have more and more countries coming online that you may need to deter, uh, you've pretty soon run out of numbers to cover all of those targets. And you can't count on, um, let's say, a Russia being very benign while somebody else is creating a problem for us. So in the, in the guidance doctrine that develops the, the weapons to fit the threat, you have to take all of these things into consideration. The quality of your weaponry and what kind of a hedge you have to have, the fact that we don't have a nuclear production capacity anymore, we just have to fix up the old ones that we have. Russia does have such a capacity. The fact that our allies are, are essentially going down in their ability to help us. I'm talking about Great, Great Britain and France here. 32 countries depend on us. Other countries are proliferating. Are we still going to have the numbers we need? Once our weapons are gone, they're gone because we don't have a new production capability, as I said, like the Russians and Chinese do. So this is a very important uh, factor to take into account. I noticed that uh, the chairman of the all-powerful House Armed Services Committee is here, and uh, we're going to count on him to further discuss the issues of the general decline uh, in things like missile defense, in conventional capability, as well as all of the things associated with our nuclear capability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Uh, thank you, Senator Kyle. In view of the fact that uh, Chairman McKeon is here, we'll go um, right to his statement and then hope to have some time for questions afterwards. Um, Congressman Howard Buck McKeon represents the 25th District of California in the House of Representatives. In June of 2009, he was named the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee, and he now serves as the committee's chairman in the 112th Congress. Prior to serving as the ranking member on the HASC, Congressman McKeon was the top Republican on the Education and Workforce Committee for close to uh, three years. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Buck McKeon. Morning, good to be with you. Uh, we came to Congress together, Senator Talent and I, uh, 1992. And uh, we served together on the education and, and armed services. Yep. Were you on our? So I feel like we're kind of joined at the hip. Uh, thank you for having me here today. There's, there's one thing I would like to talk about, and that is cuts to the defense of our nation. I, I've, I've pretty much given up on the uh, first round of, of cuts. Yep. Last year, we voted for the, uh, uh, what did we call Deficit that? Control Act. Deficit Control Act. And, and uh, we cut almost a trillion out of our discretionary spending. Defense accounts for 20% of our national budget, but it made up 50% of the savings in that first go around. That is the budget that's been presented to us uh, by the President this week. We're in the process now of hearings. Yesterday we had uh, the Secretary Panetta and, and General uh, Dempsey. Today we'll be talking to uh, Secretary of the Navy Mavis, and, and tomorrow will be the Army, and we're, and we're going through that process now. And I know that uh, those cuts are, are pretty well locked in. There might be little changes around the fringe, but, but we are going to have about $50 billion a year for the next five years cut from defense. That budget should be passed. We'll, we'll pass our budget in the House side. I realize we're on the Senate side. We don't pass budgets over here. But, um, but there will be uh, some effort to, uh, to try to plan for spending for the next year. It'll probably result in a CR, and uh, then we go through the election, and then we'll, we'll go through dealing with, with those problems uh, probably when we get into January. Where I'm really going to focus my efforts for the rest of this year 
is the second part of the Deficit Reduction Act, and that is the, the sequestration part, where we cut another $1.1, $1.2 billion out of discretionary spending, half of that out of defense, and about, um, be about like five, six hundred billion a year that kicks in next January. Now, I've heard people say, well, uh, we'll get that fixed. In fact, I was promised that the sequestration would never happen. We'd make it so onerous that, that we would be responsible enough to make sure that that didn't happen. We had the super committee that was set up to, uh, to address that second trillion plus on the entitlement side, and we all know what happened there. They weren't able to, to complete that. And so we're left with this hanging over us that kicks in next January. I heard a member saying uh, it, that cut is supposed to be just across the board, even, even handed. The cuts that we're dealing with in this year's budget, the uh, 487 billion, the defense chiefs have had six, eight months that they've been working on this. A lot of thought, a lot of planning. They've changed the strategy, revised uh, a lot of things. And, and really put a lot of work into it. The sequestration is just automatic cut across the board. And uh, in fact, when we had a briefing last week, we had uh, Dr. Carter, Admiral Winfeld, and the service chief, uh, the service secretaries and chiefs. And one of our members asked uh, Dr. Carter, what planning, what were they doing to prepare for the sequestration cuts in January? And he says, we don't have to plan for that, it's just draw out the budget, take every line item, and cut a certain percentage off. No thought whatsoever. To me, it looks like what we're facing is total chaos next January. I heard a member saying, well, we don't have to do it that way. We can fix it. Let me just kind of go through how things really work around here or don't. We have an election in November. There's talk that the Senate might uh, change, the leadership might change. Uh, no telling what will happen in the House, no telling what's going to happen in the, in the presidential election. But I predict that will be probably some fairly uncertain times between the election and when we're, um, what, do, what do we do, sworn in in January for the, for the next Congress. Sequestration starts January 1st. The new Congress isn't sworn in until after that. So if we don't fix this problem before December 31st, it automatically starts. We have hundreds of contracts out in the Defense Department that would all have to be rewritten. When you go down that line by line on the, on the uh, budget and just take a percentage off, 8%, 9%, 12%, whatever it works out, um, that will happen. And all of the contracts that have been let, I, I was thinking about this, I, I think about it a lot. And uh, say I'm a small, I have a friend at home who has a small machinist shop. Everything that the government does, they do by contract. And so he gets contracts to make so many parts that then go to Northrop Lockheed, some company to go into a, uh, a plane or a ship or, or whatever they're, they're building. He has, I think, six employees. So all of a sudden, he's going to get cut. He's left with a contract that says, we're going to pay you so much to build so much. That's just one out of hundreds of those contracts. Is he going to just say, go ahead and rewrite it. I'll be happy with whatever you give me. And I'll just let two of my employees go. Or is he going to maybe say, I have some rights in this. I'm going to talk to an attorney and, and I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to take this to court. Multiply that time hundreds. Think of the chaos that we're going to be facing uh, next January. And so what I've tried to do is bring this to the attention 
of my colleagues to say the prudent thing, the responsible thing, is to fix this before that calamity hits or that chaos hits. So we introduced a bill that says we will pay for the first year of sequestration, for all sequestration, not just defense, but all of the discretionary spending. We'll pay for it the first year to move it back to give us some breathing room. I mean, we're going to have some very serious problems dealing with the cuts that are coming in this year's budget that are supposed to kick in next October that probably will be going into a CR that we'll still be dealing with in January, let alone the sequestration chaos on top of that. So if, if we could pay for that first year and move it back a year, it would give us some kind of breathing room to really work through these, uh, through these problems that we'll be confronting. So we pay for that, pay for that uh, first year by reducing the federal workforce by 10% through attrition. So if we have three of us work in the same department and I quit, they can't hire me, can't replace me until you both quit and then they can replace one person. And over a, a 10 year period, that will realize the money to pay for that, uh, that one year cost. That's a criticism, it takes 10 years to pay to get the one year of benefit. I think that it far offsets the, uh, the seriousness of the problems that we're, that we're going to be facing in January if we don't do that. Uh, the Senate, uh, Senator Kyle, Senator McCain have introduced a similar bill on the Senate side, very, very little difference. They're, as I understand it, they're, uh, their cut is 5% of the workforce and a freeze of uh, federal pay up till 2014. Uh, those things we could work out very easily in, in conference. I have no, I, I just see the bills very similar. The main thing is to fix the problem. So that's what I'm gonna be focused on 24-7 on, uh, for the next year because I've talked to some of the leaders of industry. Um, they are already making plans. They are already laying people off this year uh, because they know that the law says that this kicks in January 1st. So they cannot wait till December 31st to, to start realizing the savings that they need to do next uh, January 1st. If by some chance we were able to fix this in December, that means all of the layoffs that they do between now and then were needless, but they can't wait for us. Uh, you know, it, it just, it's just a serious problem, and I think we need to step up and, and get it resolved. The question was but, about uh, planned cuts in missile defense aid uh, to Israel. It just seems to me that this is a very uh, precarious time for Israel. Why would we be, with, with the saber rattling that's going on in Iran, with the autumn spring and all the unrest in the Middle East, why would we be cutting our, our strongest ally in the area, one that we've been with forever, that we have a special relation with, why would we at this point be cutting their missile defense? We should be increasing it. I'm a strong supporter of defense. I'm also a strong supporter of a sound physical uh, policy. My concern is that we've been building up for years, we've spent money we don't have. Very serious, and it's escalating uh, the last few years. Uh, and not, not all because of President Obama, it's because various reasons, but one is that 10,000 of us are going on to the Medicare and Social Security roles every day now, the baby boomers. And that's why it's just gone out of sight the, the last few years. I have real difference with the president on spending and priorities, but I, th I think he could have, in the stimulus bill, could have put some money into defense, didn't. And as you said, we've had all these cuts. I think that out of a budget the size that we have in, on the defense department, over $600 billion, if we can't find some savings, shame on us. So I think we should be at the table like everybody else. But I think we've gone overboard. When I say that the Defense Department, 
uh, accounts for 20% of overall spending, yet they took, just out of the first tranche, 50% of the savings out of defense. I think that is plenty, and that's before the sequestration. So I think we've just, we've just really gone overboard. Now, I've seen this in, in my history. I've been around a lot longer than you, and we cut back after World War I. I wasn't here then. <laughs> We cut back after World War II, after uh, Korea, after Vietnam. It seems like it's in our DNA to cut back so that we won't be prepared for the next confrontation. And that leads to the next confrontation. I was at a uh, meeting with Secretary Rumsfeld a few months ago. He met with some of the members of our committee. And he said, on 9-11, I was sitting in the Pentagon. I invited some of the members of the Armed Service Committee for breakfast. And he said, I told them, because we had just had the rundown from the Clinton-Bush, uh, or Bush-Clinton uh, drawdown. And he said, I told those members that something bad was going to happen. I didn't know when or where. And a few hours later, they hit the tower. Uh, it, it's just, as you run down your ability, your, your strength, somebody is always going to be out there to take advantage of it. And I think I've seen us do that time and time again. I've never seen us do it when we're at war. This is the first time I've seen us do a drawdown when we've actually got troops going outside the wire every day in harm's way. It's crazy. But I'm, I'm a realist and I understand that, that that's a budget that we're dealing with right now. That, that, like I said, I don't think we're going to see a lot of change in that, but we can stop the sequestration, and that definitely needs to be done. I'll introduce uh, Congressman Forbes, and while he is, uh, is thinking about his remarks, just make a you know, brief comment. I, I wrote a, a few years ago at the beginning of this latest iteration of the, the, the debt crisis that one of the challenges is that we were going to see uh, the federal government begin to act more and more like Panic Distressed Borrowers Act. Um, anybody's ever been familiar with that kind of a situation in either the private sector or the nonprofit world or even in local government levels know that the two big dangers are one that they won't they won't cut or increase revenue where they should, and the other is that they will cut where they shouldn't. I mean, there's core functions of every organization that have to be performed, um, notwithstanding the budget situation. I mean, if you're a farmer, you have to have gasoline for the combine. And uh, we're seeing that exactly now. I mean, the, the defense is bearing the burden of this, uh, uh, this uh, late concern uh, about the deficit. And so when, when the real, all you got to do is look at, at budget numbers to see the problem is there's a mismatch, an enormous mismatch, between the revenue being collected for the entitlement programs and the amount that they're costing. Now, that's as neutral a way as I can state it. So you're going to solve it either by increasing revenue or reducing the cost or both. And if they do that, they'll solve the, the deficit problem. If they don't do that, uh, slashing defense is not going to keep the government from going bankrupt. That's just reality. But the town first has to recognize reality and deal with it. And increasing amounts of energy being spent on not recognizing reality, either in the defense situation or in the budget situation, which is where, why we are where we're at. Uh, one of the advantages of being a moderator is you can insert editorial comments like that when you want to. But now we have a real speaker, um, Congressman Randy Forbes, who represents the fourth uh, District of, uh, of Virginia in the United States House of Representatives. Uh, Randy was elected to Congress in 2001. Uh, he's the chairman of the Readiness Subcommittee in the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, I've spoken and dealt often with Congressman Forbes, and there really isn't anybody here, maybe the chairman accepted, who understands the situation as well as he does and has, is as urgently concerned about it as he is, and so we're very grateful for his work and for his presence here. Congressman Forbes. Well, thank you, uh, Senator. And, and let me honestly say, a lot of places we go to talk and we say, uh, thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, today, I sincerely mean that. I thank you both for being such experts on this field, for the advice you're always willing to give to us. And thank you for all for what you're doing, because we're not seeing it happening in many other venues. And I want to start um, 
this morning by saying that I'm going to try to be brief and hit it from kind of an aerial view and because I love the questions that you're asking and I hope I get to respond to some of those. But, but, but I want to start by telling you that we're living in a world now where we have a new strategy to defend the free world. And this is it. It's eight pages, eight pages of a new strategy to defend the world. And I want to tell you, for those of you who have studied this and read this, and I tell you, I may step on a few toes today, including mine, but forgive me, but it's just what you asked me to do. This strategy is not the strategy of a superpower. This is a menu for mediocrity. And if we buy into the fact that this is a strategy for a superpower, woe to us. Now, the salesman of this new strategy would try to convince us they have a new term now, it's called acceptable risk. In fact, if you extrapolate acceptable risk out, you're talking about really acceptable chances. And what you see us doing now with this new strategy is we're talking about the defense of this country pretty much as if it was some kind of game at a table in a Vegas casino, and it's not, as you know. I had an ambassador in my office not too long ago. He was sitting down, he was talking about the fact their country had made some cuts. Uh, to defense, and he said it wasn't the end of the world. Everything didn't fall apart. I reached over and put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, Mr. Ambassador, if you made a mistake, if you miscalculated, if something happened and you were wrong, who is your backstop? And he looked to me and he said, you. And I said, that's right. I said, but if we make a mistake, if we miscalculate, we have no backstop because we're the backstop of freedom in all the world, and we've got to remember that, and we can't forget that. Now, what, what's so amazing to me, as you and I sit around and we look at some of this uh, stuff that's happening with just these um, eight pages that we have, we're actually looking back sometime, and we, if we're careful, we're going to, or not careful, we're going to see the dismantling of the greatest military the world has ever done, not by some Goliath that rose up some other part of the world, but by the thousand cuts that we set back and just let take place. If we're just quiet and we listen, we're hearing literally the clanking as we're taking it apart bolt by bolt now. But what's amazing to me is not that that's happening. What's amazing to me is the deafening silence that's out there by so many people. You know, I am just waiting. I'm waiting for this. And look, forgive me if, it, you know, for, for again, stepping on these toes. But it's amazing to me. I keep wanting to see where are the admirals that are going to come up to the table and pound on the table and say, you can't destroy my Navy. Where are the generals that are going to come and start pounding on the table and say, you're not going to destroy the force structure that I have. Where are the Marines that are going to come there and say, we can't do away with all our prepositioned stocks that we have. And I keep listening, and it's quiet. And then I listen to members of Congress, and let me tell you, they're just as guilty. I'm sitting there listening and saying, where's the leadership stepping up, stepping up to the plate and saying, we're not going here. And you know why they're not going there? Because they put these blinders on as they walk down. And, and look, they're good guys. I'm not pointing fingers. You know, I'm just saying, and they got led down to this budget control act where we had $487 billion of cuts, and you don't hear them saying, my gosh, look at what these cuts are going to do. Everybody's just talking about sequestration. I'm not at sequestration yet. I want to come back to these more than $87 billion of cuts and say we can't afford to do those. And it's not just me, Secretary Panetta. The other day to my questions, I asked him, I said, is this the number you would have picked? He said, no, it's too much. And yet we've got those kind of cuts that are going quietly into the night and we're not here. And then the other thing is we're the employers around the country that are saying, you know, if, if we have these kind of cuts that come place and if they are just a third of what they estimate, they will equal cuts that would be the same as all of the current unemployed people in West Virginia, New Mexico, Maine, Nebraska, Montana, Hawaii, New Hampshire, Delaware, Alaska, South Dakota, Vermont, Wyoming, and North Dakota combined. That's a big deal thing, and it's this deafening silence that we're hearing out there. And where's the public that's sitting back there and saying, my gosh, we're looking at this rise of China right now. They're building up military capability like we've never seen before. Iran today, as you and I are sitting in here, are trying to get the capacity to hit every geographical area in the United States with a nuclear weapon. And Lord only knows what we see happening with Iran. And what are we doing? We're saying, no, no, let's have an eight-page new strategy that says that we can cut $487 billion, we can cut another half trillion dollars, and we can have a couple rounds of racks, and we're going to make the world a lot safer. And that frightens me. Now, the reality of this here, when somebody asks about the economic situation we're in, 
The administration essentially spent the military's future on an $800 billion stimulus package. Um, and then what they're trying to now convince us is this, that somehow or the other there's some grand but unexplainable new world strategy, which means that having fewer ships than your potential adversary, having potentially fewer warheads than your potential enemy, having fewer planes than you need in a drastic release force structure will somehow make us all safer and make us better. And you and I both know that's not true. Now, we all know this. Going back to basic 101 on defense planning, it, it's pretty simple. What you have to do is to develop your strategy first by looking at the risk and the threat assessment you have, the resources that you need to comply with that strategy, and then you develop a budget from that. That is not what took place. What took place by all the testimony, everybody knows, is we gave $487 billion of cuts and we said, now you develop a strategy that will fit within the parameters of those budget cuts. And that's what they did. And, and so all of a sudden we now have truly a strategy that's being driven by the budget, not a budget that's being driven by the strategy. And that's a dangerous, dangerous formula for us as the free world to be buying into. Now, the other thing I want to just point out to you is this, the result of that is if we just take a snapshot of the Navy. We know an independent panel reviewing the QDR, bipartisan, best experts we had, Republican, Democrat, everybody said they could never agree on anything. Here's what they agreed on. They made a recommendation. You need a minimum of at least 346 ships in our Navy. The Navy says, oh, no, no, they're wrong. We only need 313. So for years, you and I have been hearing 313 is the absolute floor. That's what we need. Bumped it up to 328 one year. But now they're coming back, and all of a sudden, we've got this new strategy that we don't use computers anymore. We use a pencil with an eraser, and we come in and say, uh-uh, we were just wrong. We didn't need 346. We didn't need 328. We didn't need 313. All we need now is 285. We're good to go for the next five years. And you and I know, while we're doing that, Chinese are saying, okay, we've got more ships in our Navy now than you've got in your Navy, and we're going to keep building while you're reducing. That makes sense. Pre-positioned stocks, we've always based a Marine Corps and being able to get someplace quick and be able to stay for 30 days, we're going to say now, no, no, that's okay. We don't need them prepositioned. Let's pull them back here. Even if it takes us nine months to reposition them, it's okay because we're going to have a nine-month lead time on any conflict we have in the world. Good luck on that one. The Air Force came back, you know, a few months ago. We heard, uh, let's cut out the F-22 and cut out 240 planes, but that's the floor. We're not going below that. Now we're here, we're going to cut out another 300 planes. And the Army going to cut out 80,000 of our men and women in uniform, but we're going to all be safer. Now, let me just say this. Um, what do we need to do? And where do we need to go from here? Here's what I think we need to do. You and I can't go quietly into the night. You know, we, I look at even our military folks when I speak around the country, and there's a glaze there because they're afraid to speak up. They think this is a done deal. They're concerned that they could lose their jobs. These guys stand up for us every single day to defend this country. We've got to speak out for them. And the great news is this. We can write all the op-ed pieces we want. We can have great forums like this. But unless we change this debate across the country, it's not going to change. So we're beginning. We're going to start a speak-up tour from members of the Armed Services Committee to go around this country. And we hope it's going to be the most comprehensive opportunity we've had yet to give the public an opportunity to come out and say what they think about these defense cuts and where they are. I think it's an opportunity for us to change this debate in the hearts and the minds of the people in this country because what we need to do, somebody asked earlier uh, what, how we balance this with the cuts and what we need to do to the deficit. Let me just say this. The, the question we need to be asking is one, how much can we afford to spend? But we're not asking the corollary question that needs to go with that. And that is, what is the price tag and the risk the United States of America takes if we don't supply these resources? That's what we need to be telling the American people. And I'm convinced if America knows that, they're going to respond and say, we don't want to go down this path. We want to continue to have the greatest military the world's ever known. Thank you very much for letting me be with you. We have another great speaker, uh, Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn, who represents the seventh district of, uh, of Tennessee. Um, she's earned a special uh, reputation as a bipartisan leader and a policy expert on telecommunications issues and intellectual property rights. She serves in the Energy and Commerce Committee. She's vice chairman of the Subcommittee on uh, Oversight, and she serves on two other critical Energy and Commerce subcommittees, Health and Communications and Tec Technology. Congresswoman Blackburn. Thank you. Thank you, Senator.
Senator, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here with you today. And indeed, uh, hearing from Congressman Forbes, who has been one of the great leaders for our men and women in military, and I appreciate that because one of the great honors that I have in my service is having the opportunity to represent the men and women at Fort Campbell. Now, as many of you know, Fort Campbell, Kentucky is actually primarily located in Tennessee. And many of those men and women who call Fort Campbell home actually live on the Tennessee side of that line. And you know these troops, the 101st Airborne, the 5th Special Forces, and the Army's 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment. And they're the ones that piloted Navy SEAL Team 6 in the raid on Osama bin Laden. And every soldier that has called Fort Campbell home has undergone some of the most intensive physical and mental training. And it's amazing to me to see the dedication that they bring to the, the fight. And we know that these men and women have really earned the right, the right, to be a part of this nation's military and to carry out the mission that is given them in the fight against global terrorism. However, despite all of the bravery, the sacrifice, the perseverance, and being one of the most deployed units over the past decade, which the 101st has been, many soldiers that I represent are currently facing a lot of uncertainty. And as we visit, we talk about that uncertainty. They are not only uncertain about the status of their missions abroad, but sadly, on top of the stress of combat, they have to worry about the status of their own employment. These fears are by no means far-fetched or out of the realm of possibility. These are well-trained men and women who are trained as soldiers and they face an uncertain future. If anyone in this room had read only the headlines, just the headlines, in the lead up to President Obama's 2013 budget, you would have been greeted with great reassurances such as these. A budget strategy that courts disaster. Obama's defense budget, broken promises, a defense budget that erodes America's military power and no superpower here. Those were the headlines. That is what our men and women in uniform were greeted with. That type of uncertainty. Unfortunately, these perilous warnings have not slowed down the President's biting determination to move forward with defense cuts with the same zeal that helped him push through Obamacare. The President fails to realize that not all change is good change, and the only hope his budget provides are reassurances to people who are not our friends. They are our enemies. All who would like nothing more than to see the U.S. surrender its position as the world's sole superpower. Most astonishingly, however, is that under his budget proposal, President Obama has decidedly looked into the future and predicted that the U.S. will never again have to fight a major ground war. It is amazing the decisions that he arrived at. His budget also makes a bold prediction that our future enemies are going to be gracious and accommodating to our military and diplomacy needs to ensure that we will not be forced into waging two simultaneous wars in different regions of the globe. I make that assessment because if passed, the President's proposal would do this, and Congressman Forbes just spoke to this, and I'm sure that Chairman McKeon has done likewise. But these numbers are frightening to those of us that are concerned about our nation's security. It would slash $487 billion from the military over the next 10 years. Our military 
could most likely suffer, survive one cut of that magnitude. But you've got that 487 billion. That is in addition to the 330 billion which was cut through 2010 and a potential $500 billion cut that would occur later this year through sequestration. So all total, you're looking at $1.3 trillion that would be cut to our nation's defense when they are already operating on razor thin levels. That's $1.3 trillion. That's the size of the cut. Last month in a speech at the Pentagon, the President pledged, and I'm quoting him, to keep faith with those who serve by making sure our troops have the equipment and capabilities they need to succeed, and by prioritizing efforts that focus on wounded warriors, mental health, and the well-being of our military families, end quote. I am uh, afraid that President Obama and I have very, very different interpretations of what it means to keep faith with our troops, with our military families, with our veterans. The President's definition is to give out pink slips to 80,000 soldiers, 80,000 well-trained, dedicated, focused men and women, 20,000 Marines, cut military pay, and increase the cost of TRICARE, making it more difficult for our veterans to receive the military medical benefits and treatment that they deserve. In addition, the President's budget will eliminate six Air Force Tactical Squadrons, 27 C5As, 65 C-130s, which, as you know, that is the workhorse when it comes to moving troops and material around the globe and nearly halt, halt the acquisition of the F-35s, which are greatly needed to contain China and keep our allies in the Asia Pacific safe from attack. However, if, if some of you are thinking that the Navy has been left out of this esteemed discussion, I would encourage you to have no fear. The President's budget is an equal opportunity force eliminator that cuts every single branch of the military. Our U.S. Naval Fleet, which is already operating at its smallest level. Can you believe that? Smallest level. Since the beginning of the 20th century, we'll be forced to retire seven cruisers, eliminate two littoral combat ships, and slow down work on amphibious ships and an attack submarines. In the words of Tom Donnelly, I'll take the opportunity to quote you here, kind sir. And I'm quoting, the Obama administration isn't just seeking a rebalancing of U.S. strategy, it intends to make a permanent retreat by removing the military means of mischief. With a smaller force, we resist the temptation to fight wars just because we can, end quote. In other words, this president believes that the U.S. is addicted to the use of military force. He is seizing upon the opportunity of deficit reduction and is not letting it go to waste by handicapping our future ability to engage in military conflicts. Similar to how a drug addict undergoing treatment seeks to eliminate their source of addiction once and for all. This elimination would strategically benefit a passive president by reducing the number of tough choices when it comes to military engagements and give them the convenient excuse that there is nothing we can do to intervene. Those of us mothers call that avoidance. After a final review of the President's budget, my biggest disappointment is that it fails to place any value in the power of human capital and experience. If you take the President's words at face value, you must acknowledge that he seeks a bold shift towards strengthening our presence in the Asia Pacific. However, based on the budget, just as Mr. Forbes said, this goal is already doomed from the start. Any successful presence in the Asia Pacific will require more than the use of Special Operations Forces drones and 2,500 Marines based in Northern Australia. 
These valued resources should only be used to supplement our military force and not act as a de facto replacement. Furthermore, the latest drone or military system can always be accelerated into development to meet the latest demands of war. The same, however, cannot be said for our military leadership. It takes time to properly recruit and develop our next class of military leaders. It takes time, it takes patience, it takes endurance and dedication. So while we may rapidly recruit, train, deploy entire divisions, much as what we did in World War II, where we had to rapidly recruit, train, and deploy World War II. As Fred Kagan has rightfully pointed out regarding World War II, it all came at a very high price in the number of U.S. lives that were lost. So thank you for allowing me to come spend a few moments with you this morning. I am looking forward to continuing the conversation. I am deeply appreciative of the leadership that you all are bringing and the attention that you are bringing to this issue. Our men and women in uniform appreciate and need your dedication and focus. Thank you. I think President Reagan was the last president who really understood that defense policy is at a very fundamental level foreign policy. And no matter what foreign policy you want to follow, um, it, it has a better chance of success if you're perceived as doing it from a platform of strength. So we greatly increased American power in the 80s, which contributed directly to winning the Cold War. Then in the 90s, of course, we cut that back uh, in, the, in the budget cuts of those years. I'll get back to this in just a minute. Uh, the point I wanted to make is uh, force structure was cut in the 1990s down to a level that people perceived as being more appropriate in the post-Cold War era. Uh, I actually think we did the drawdown in the 1990s a little better than we've done it sometimes in the past, except with regard to the Army. Uh, it was believed at the time that the United States was not going to be involved in a major land war, and so the Army was cut very low. Well, of course, the problem is if you cut the capabilities, that doesn't eliminate the risk and the threats for which you need the capabilities. And in fact, we were, within a short period of time, involved in two very major ground engagements. <clears throat> and you'll notice that we had to fight the Iraq war while we were holding in Afghanistan. And that was largely because the Army was not big enough and was not able to prosecute both engagements at the same time as vigorously as we should which caused the Afghanistan engagement to last several years longer than it should have, even assuming we're able to get out and create a stable situation, which cost hundreds of billions of dollars, dwarfing any savings that were achieved in the 90s. Anybody who believes that these cuts that are now underway are going to save the American government money over the long run simply has not understood the lessons of history. What it's going to require us to do at a certain point, probably in, in the intermediate, at least in the intermediate future, but maybe in the very near future, is engaged in a huge buildup, throwing money at the situation, just as we had to do with the MRAMs, because we didn't have that capability. Well, how much does that program cost? $30 yeah, $30 billion. Because if you were an assistant secretary of the Army in the late 1990s, with modernization budgets that had been shrunk more than the force structure budgets, and you were asked to figure what you would need, and, and you, were, you, had to, you had to prioritize so narrowly because we didn't have enough money, you would not have figured because the doctrine was we're not going to put a, lot, a, a large land force in uh, on the ground anyway, you would not have built up armored Humvees, and they didn't. And so when we did have to build it, we, it cost us billions and billions more than we would have spent if we'd anticipated and honestly budgeted and planned. All right, I've given you enough time to collect your thoughts, Senator. Uh, also allowed me to cathart a little bit here. Uh, Senator Kelly Ayotte represents the state of New Hampshire in the United States Senate. She was a prosecutor and is a prosecutor at heart. She was the first woman to serve as a state's attorney general, appointed that position in 2004. She was twice reappointed by a Democratic governor, and she was elected to the United States Senate in 2010 with 60 percent of the vote. I've had a chance to work with the senator, and she's one of the bright new crop of senators and members who gives one real hope for the future of this body and the future of the country. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Senator Ayotte. Thank you so much, Jim. I appreciate it. It's great to be here with you. Uh, I certainly want to thank AEI and the Heritage Foundation, the Foreign Policy Institute, for putting together this important event today, 
and it's really an honor to be here with my other colleagues that you've heard speak. Uh, I want to start with a quote today. Uh, I just came from a SASC hearing with uh, Director Clapper and General Burgess talking about the threats we face, um, and we face many challenges right now. But let me start with this quote. <clears throat> what seems to have been lost in all this debate is the simple truth of how a defense budget is arrived at. It isn't done by deciding to spend a certain number of dollars. We start by considering what must be done to maintain peace and review all the possible threats against our security. There is no logical way that you can say, let's spend X billion dollars less. You can only say which part of our defense measures do, you believe, do we believe we can do without and still have security against all contingencies? Anyone in Congress who advocates a percentage or a specific dollar cut in defense spending should be made to say what part of our defenses he would eliminate. And he should be candid enough to acknowledge that his cuts mean cutting our commitments to allies or inviting greater risk or both. We maintain our strength in order to deter and defend against aggression, to preserve freedom and peace. Deterrence means simply this, making sure any adversary who thinks about attacking the United States or our allies or our vital interests concludes that the risks to him outweigh any potential gains. Once he understands that, that he won't attack, we maintain the peace through our strength. Weakness only invites aggression. These comments couldn't be more relevant today, yet they were made 30 years ago on March 23rd of 1983 by President Ronald Reagan. Wouldn't it be nice to have a president in the Oval Office today who spoke again like that about the importance of maintaining American military supremacy, and the importance and understanding that the best way to preserve peace is to prepare for war, unfortunately. But that's been the truth and the reality of it, and President Ronald Reagan understood that. To be fair, this president certainly deserves some credit uh, for the bin Laden raids. He deserves some credit for his willingness to use drone strikes. But if you look overall, strategically, of what he has done, I think it's been woefully inadequate. It started with when he apologized for America and when he failed to stand up for the Iranians that were in the street asking for what we take for granted in this country, basic rights and democracy, when he looked the other way, thinking that he could negotiate with that regime. We've seen time and time and again where he's actually, unfortunately, put political considerations above what needs to be done for the interest of our national security and that of our allies. I think we've seen it in Iraq in failing to keep a follow-on force there and the power vacuum that has created and the loss of security in Iraq, which didn't have to happen, yet we see it now with greater influence from Iran. We saw it with his decision in Afghanistan, unfortunately, and one need only look at his decision to withdraw 23,000 of the surge troops in the middle of the fighting season in Afghanistan, rather than waiting at least a couple of months to put our troops in the unenviable position of having to withdraw while they're fighting the Taliban during the fighting season. That was not recommended by any of his top commanders. And frankly, I've asked them in the Armed Services Committee whether they could offer me any strategic reason why you would withdraw those 23,000 troops in the middle of the fighting season. And not one could give me a strategic reason why you would do that. But we do know one thing. There's an election in November, and if you take the 23,000 troops out by October, you can certainly say before your election that you've done that. But that is putting political considerations above what is right for our national security and, frankly, what is right 
for our troops when we're asking them to do two things at once. Unfortunately, I see somewhat of the same pattern with where we are right now with the defense budget, defense spending. We have the sword of Damocles hanging over defense spending with sequestration, and yet we have a president actually who I think has just stepped aside, has not taken the leadership a commander in chief should take to say directly to the American people, I won't undermine your national security. I won't hollow out our force. I won't let that happen because I have the courage to take on the entire drivers of our debt. Because I look at where we are today and I think about the initial $487 billion that is going to be reduced from the Department of Defense as reflected in the 2013 budget. And it really begs the question. The question is this, where did that number come from? Isn't it just an arbitrary number that we came up with here, that the President signed off on? It actually has no relationship to a strategy and no relationship to actually what we need. I don't know what the number is. I certainly understand that we face a fiscal crisis in this country, that we have to address the debt. I appreciate Admiral Mullen's comments when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in terms of the debt being the greatest threat to our national security. But to come up with an arbitrary number doesn't tell us what type of risk we are taking on. And we heard from Secretary Panetta the other day in the Senate Armed Services Committee when he said to us very clearly, when you cut a half trillion dollars from the Department of Defense, you are taking on additional risk. So what is it? What are we taking on in terms of additional risk? Well, General Dempsey, who is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, was asked uh, by Ranking Member McCain, have you submitted a risk assessment to Congress? The answer is no. So here's where we are. We have a number that was come up with really on an arbitrary basis to cut the Department of Defense $487 billion. We know we are taking on additional risk we have not received a risk assessment from the administration, so we really don't know fully what risks and what choices we are making in terms of the security of the American people and our allies. And I will tell you that I don't think that we should take one action on the defense budget until we get that risk assessment and know exactly what we're getting into. And that will be my position I don't think we should do a defense authorization without a risk assessment. I don't think that our appropriators should decide to sign on to $487 billion in reduction until we can look the American people in the eye and let them know what choices are being made here and uh, what risk we are putting them at. But that's where we are right now. And I think we find ourselves here because if you look at that Budget Control Act, and boy, I'll tell you, I'm so glad I voted against it for so many reasons. Uh, but if you look at it, we left 60% of our overall spending on the table. We left it on the table because the deal itself, the cuts that were going to come forward were, frankly, insufficient to deal with our debt crisis. Putting our Defense Department on the chopping block isn't going to address this debt crisis in the way we need to. Uh, we left the mandatory spending piece of our entitlements of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, other mandatory programs on the table. So what you end up at the end of the day with, if for some reason, God forbid, we go forward with sequestration, which would of course be devastating to our national security, uh, basically 15 to 20 percent of our budget taking 50 percent of the hit. And a portion of our budget, let's not forget, the fundamental purpose of why we have a government, enumerated in our Constitution, 
Think about all the other things we do around here that weren't identified by our founding fathers, that aren't in our Constitution. If we don't have security, we don't have anything else. You all know that because not only the devastating sacrifice of life that came from 9-11, but look at the impact on our economy that came from 9-11. And that's where we find ourselves because around here we haven't shown the courage to take on the real drivers of our debt. Instead, we're just going to arbitrarily put our Department of Defense on the chopping block without a risk assessment to know what choices we are making as Congress. So I, for one, am not going to allow that to happen, and I certainly am going to continue to make sure that we know exactly what will happen if we go forward with this $487 billion.